Okay, so anyways, first of all, hi everyone. So thank you all for coming. Uh, once again, we're really excited uh, for our speaker today, who, uh, Professor Tracy Chippendale, uh, who is an occupational therapist and uh, her clinical background and research interests are in geriatrics. Uh, her research in the Department of Occupational Therapy at NYU focus on interventions that enable older adults to age in place, including non-pharmacological interventions for depressive symptoms, interventions to increase the healthcare workforce in geriatrics, and outdoor falls prevention. And her research has been published in the American Journal of Occupational Therapy, uh, the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, and the Gerontologist. And we are in extremely excited to have her today uh, to be talking to us about outdoor falls prevention, uh, promoting safety in urban neighborhoods. And with that, I will hand it off to you, Tracy. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for your introduction. I hope everybody can see my screen. Looks good. Great. Uh, so yeah, as uh, the introduction said, I'm an occupational therapist and associate professor at NYU in the OT department. And just for people who maybe aren't in the field, uh, some of the overall overarching theme of my scholarship really is aging in place. So what that means is helping older adults to maintain, um, you know, to be active and engaged in their own homes and communities, as opposed to going to, for um, long-term care services. So that's a little bit about aging in place, and that's really the focus of my work. And today I am going to talk a little bit about outdoor falls, outdoor falls prevention in urban environments and particularly uh, in and around New York City, which has been the focus of my work uh, for a while. So a little bit of background information uh, for those who don't have a health science background is that falls are very common among older adults. It's a really, uh, it's a public health problem and something that warrants attention. Uh, and in rehabilitation, we spend a lot of time making adaptations to the home environment, which is obviously very important to make people's own homes and apartments safe um, and to reduce risk of falls that way. But we actually know that outdoor falls um, are more likely to be caused by an environmental hazard. So it's something that needs attention, uh, should be addressed. Um, and we actually, if you look at the risk factors, they look a little bit different for people who fall in their home versus people who fall outside. So that's something else we wanna take into consideration. Uh, and there's a lot of existing fall prevention programs. So it's great. We have a lot of evidence-based programs uh, that are for older adults living in the community that have been shown to be effective uh, in, in regards to falls prevention. They primarily focus on indoor risk factors though. So some of them touch a little bit on outdoor risk factors, but it's really not the emphasis of those programs. And so uh, that's also what's led me to my work. Uh, and a little bit about Vision Zero, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Vision Zero, this idea that we want to minimize or, you know, in fact, eliminate those uh, pedestrian um, traffic fatalities. And we know that older adults are disproportionately represented uh, in the population of people at risk. And so that's another issue. And we know um, from, from prior uh, research that there's certain key issues around pedestrian safety for older adults. So things like time to cross the street, um, turning vehicles, uh, and then pedestrian ramps being um, not suitable. And who has it, who in New York has not encountered pooling of rainwater, right? When you go to cross the street and at the bottom of that curb, you see a big puddle. And so if you're an older adult with a little bit of a balance impairment, that's even more problematic. And so those are just some of the issues that have been identified um, through, the, through the work of Vision Zero. So I actually, in 2011, I wrote an issue paper uh, about occupational therapy and how we need to focus on neighborhood environments um, and safety, promoting safety in, in uh, the neighborhood. Um, and that should be a focus. So I started with an issue paper back in 2011 and I've been working in this area ever since. Um, so one of the earlier studies I did was I did a qualitative study where I interviewed older adults, primar primarily in lower Manhattan, to really get a sense of um, you know, what the issues were. So explore you know, their experiences in their neighborhoods in relation to um, uh, fear of falling, perceived risk of falls, but also looking at the positive side. So what are some of the resources available to older adults in the community um, to help with falls prevention? So um, this is some of the major themes that I found in this study. So the built environment actually does contribute to both the, the perceived risk of fall and also fear of falling. So, uh, fear of falling is both the consequences of a fall, but also it's a risk factor for falls. And so um, that was important to know that features of the neighborhood environment were really having a negative impact uh, on some older adults in that regard. 
Um, and certain things that were mentioned, uh, which are not surprising, uneven walking surfaces, um, inadequate maintenance. So both in terms of um, snow clearance, as well as just um, you know, poor conditions. So potholes, cracks, uneven sidewalks, uh, and then also poor lighting. So those are just some of the things that were identified. But it's interesting, people are resourceful, right? And so some, what seniors often do is they come up with strategies, right? And they, they use some old, their own personal strategies to try to adapt to those risk factors. And so um, certain things like people change their gait or the way they walked, uh, they might sort of choose different footwear to try to be a little bit safer um, and also using the social environment, right? So asking somebody for help, you know, can I have your seat? Um, can you hold that door for me? So that was also some of the, some of the findings around uh, people using strategies. Uh, and even though there's some definitely some barriers to physical activity and, and some risks for falls uh, within the community, there's also resources. And we know that of course, physical activity and certain types of physical activity are really key uh, to help reduce the risk of falls. And so the neighborhood environment um, offers that. And so uh, everything you, know, you would think of, so walking paths, but other things maybe you didn't think of. So you know, in the summertime, pre-pandemic, we have a lot of street fairs, right? So people you know, sell all kinds of things on the street and actually was a resource for a lot of people to get physical activity, to go up and walk up and down those street fairs. Um, other examples of resources would be things like a fence near the sidewalk. So you probably didn't even notice there was a fence near the sidewalk, but if you're an older adult and have a little bit of a balance impairment, that fence can actually be helpful on a windy day, for example. And so those are the kind of things that were identified. Um, people love time traffic lights, right? So if you have a slow gate speed and it's gonna take you a certain amount of time to cross that road, if you are alerted to how many seconds you have left, that's an incredible resource, right? Because sometimes you just wait for the next light if you don't have enough time to cross. And so that was identified as an important um, strength. And then crossing guards. I think we often, you know, you think about crossing guards, which help school children uh, to go across the street during after school and uh, uh, prior to beginning of school, but older adults found that is an important resource to be able to, to cross the road safely as well. So I think certain things that are available, um, you know, became, became important resources. Some barriers to physical activity and exercise was another theme and things like dog walkers, right? We see that a lot in New York City, people walking their dogs. Sometimes the leashes are a little bit long and people can get caught up in that. And I don't know if you knew this, but in New York City, there's actually a law against that and that you should not have a dog leash longer than six feet. Um, but sometimes people do and people get caught up in that or just if you're walking on the sidewalk and there's five dogs, uh, you know, skirting past you, you can see it's that as being a risk factor for people. Um, other things were, you know, just the, 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 the fact that New York City, the pace is really fast. And so if you have a little bit of a slower gait speed, sometimes people felt pressure to walk faster and keep up with the pace. Um, so that's another uh, um, another sort of barrier. And then programmatic um, uh, accommodations at gyms. So you think about people want to, you know, work on strength training. They want to, you know, engage in um, cardiopulmonary endurance training. Uh, but if you go to your local gym, some of the classes that was, you know, some of the seniors reported that some of those classes weren't at their level, right? So you could take a class, but it may not uh, accommodate your needs in terms of fitness levels. Uh, but of course, there's certain motivators uh, that were in the neighborhood that really encourage people to get out. Uh, and so for, for some people who lived alone, that's just the opportunity to socialize, right? To be able to get out and interact even with strangers um, in the community, you know, just connecting with people. And so that was a motivator for people to actually get outside and, and be physically active, um, as well as aesthetics, which we know there's some beautiful places in New York where you can watch, you can walk and enjoy um, uh, the architecture and some, some greenery. So that was my uh, original study after my issue paper that kind of got things rolling in this regard. And I followed it up actually with a survey. It's a telephone survey. I use random digit telephone dialing across the five boroughs of New York. And my idea was to really try to understand what do people know about outdoor fall risks? What don't they know? Um, and also to, to explore among people who had fallen outdoors, what were some of the sort of the findings there and what were some of the causes? Um, and so the, it was interesting that in terms of perceived risk, some people were very good at sort of pointing, you know, picking up things that we know are a problem. So street and sidewalk conditions that was commonly uh, reported as a perceived risk, right? So we're talking about, again, uneven sidewalks, um, cracked sidewalks, that kind of thing. 
Uh, some things they did, people did not identify, and what's interesting, or these are actually, if you look at uh, the research of other people who've really kind of, um, you know, looked at these, these uh, features of the environment, um, was things like parking lots and garages and recreational areas like a local park. So those are actually uh, hot spots for outdoor falls, uh, we know from, from prior studies, and that was not something that people was on their radar. Um, and then strategies used for prevention. So some things were really commonly used by people. So things like um, holding rails on stairs, um, visual scanning to make sure you're, you're you know, scanning your environment and you're not gonna miss that uneven surface or that, um, uh, that obstacle. Um, and then also we, I looked at, um, uh, oh, some least commonly used strategies. So things that people weren't doing is they were not advocating for themselves to, uh, to promote change. So whether that's contacting the city to report a problem or working with build, their building maintenance for areas you know, surrounding the building. So that's things people really didn't do is advocate for change to the environment. Um, the other thing that people were not doing is asking for help. <laughs> so as a general rule, people didn't feel comfortable necessarily or didn't bother to ask, let's say somebody, you know, somebody in your social environment to help for help when you run into some, some difficulties. Uh, and here's some causes of outdoor fall. So as, as I said, this was a random digit survey across the five boroughs. In the end, I had, I think, 120 participants uh, representing like said, the, all, all boroughs across the city. And, um, and the inter it's not surprising that we had a large percentage of people who responded to that survey who had had an outdoor fall and therefore had an interest in this, this type of um, study and work. And so uh, about 70% of the people that we did interview um, had had an outdoor fall. And here's some factors that they said were related or, or uh, precipitated the fall. So environmental factors, objects. So people would stumble on sticks, stones, um, metal, uh, you know, somebody stumbled on a metal spike sticking up. So those are the type of things that, uh, the environmental things, uh, as well as surface conditions. So that was both uh, the quality of the pavement, but also whether it's obviously slippery or wet, um, and then also slopes. Right, so it could be a sloped curb cut, it could be a sloped ramp, and if the weather conditions are not good, that can be problematic. Um, and then stairs, so stairs are a risk factor for everybody, um, not just older adults, and that was a major cause of a lot of people's outdoor falls. Uh, also, it's not just the environment um, that uh, people, you know, report as being, you know, the cause of their fall, but things like the type of activities they were doing. So things like opening doors, engaging in, in vigorous physical activity, um, socializing uh, with other people and therefore being distracted and not picking up those hazards. Uh, just walking the dog and being pulled or jerked, right? So those are the type of activities that people said precipitated the fall outside. Um, also people's behaviors. So things like you know, wearing inappropriate footwear, um, just not paying attention, either talking on the phone or being distracted by talking to a friend. Uh, and also fast walking speed. So we actually know that from other studies that it's the fast walkers that often get into trouble outside. Um, and then also not surprising when you fall, it's usually not just one cause, right? It's not just, oh, there was an environmental hazard. Uh, I, you know, I slipped on the uneven or I tripped on the uneven sidewalk. It's usually a combination of things, right? So often it was um, something in the environment, but also your own behavior. Again, so it was usually that combination of factor, like I wore the wrong shoes or I, um, I was rushing that day, right? So that's something that was, that was common as well, that you know, combined factors. So those studies, um, the qualitative study and then the survey study I did uh, follow, you know, uh, following that basically led me to develop a new program. And so, especially as you know, I'm, I'm clinically trained and have been an occupational therapist for 25 years. Um, and so I really was able to use some of that scholarship and some of that knowledge to develop a new program that specifically targets outdoor falls. And so I named the program Stroll Safe, um, as I said, based on existing research. And uh, I really, you know, in terms of guiding the development of the program, I used these are very common models um, for uh, health promotion programs. So ecological and health belief models are what I used to inform the development of the, of the program. So what does it look like? Um, so Stroll Safe, basically it's a community-based program. It meets once a week for seven weeks. And every time we meet, we meet for about an hour and a half. Um, so it's group-based. So usually I have between 10 and 12 um, older adults in each of the group sessions. 
And I created a program manual. So an intervention research in, in health, health sciences, that's, that's important, right? You wanna make sure that it's not a black box, but you actually know exactly what, you know, each step of a intervention looks like and that somebody could replicate it. So, um, so that was important. And so I developed a program manual as part of the, the program. Um, and actually refined it. So I developed an initial version and then I refined it based on a feasibility study, which I'll uh, talk about briefly. A little bit about who's generally eligible for uh, the program and sort of what I've done in the past. So I've targeted people uh, age 60 and over and also people who've either had um, you know, multiple falls um, in the past year or have had one fall in the past year and had an injury or who have a fear of falling. So those are the, the criteria I've used uh, in the past. So uh, a little bit about what that program looks like. So I told you a little about the time frame, but what we do is um, it's, it's designed to be led by an occupational therapist who comes to the group with some, you know, the knowledge of, of in rehabilitation. So brings that knowledge um, and, you know, does some information sharing, does some demonstrations, but then it's really a group process where the older adult participants get to share their own concerns and their own ideas, right? If you're an older adult, you have a lot of life experience to draw from, a lot of great ideas, and you bring that to the group. And so um, basically older adults come up with ideas about, first of all, the risks that they're experiencing, the, 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 um, the challenges, and then group discussion and problem solving, we can often come up with some great solutions um, to those uh, issues that have been identified. So we also transcribed all those great ideas and they become handouts um, for the program. And so people, you know, sometimes um, you can hear the information, but then having, you know, having the, the, the backup um, uh, transcripts of what we've talked about is, is helpful to have, be something that you can take away. Uh, also, we do action planning because what I always say to the seniors, and I'm, I'm running this program in two sites right now in Coney Island, um, is that what we know and what we do are sometimes two different things. And so it's one thing to talk about things, discuss good ideas, but then you have to put them into action. So action plans would be every week, we ask the seniors to write down a couple of things that they're gonna do in the coming week to be a bit safer. So that's part of the program as well. And then it's not all just group discussion and, and demonstrations. We actually go outside into the community and we do community mobility practice sessions. So I actually take people out and I coach them on ways to do things safer, um, whether that's going up and down a curb, going up and down stairs, opening a heavy door. Um, so we get the opportunity to, to practice that in the group. Um, we also do a neighborhood audit. So there's a tool that was designed by a colleague of mine in um, Vancouver in conjunction with some researchers in Quebec and in Germany. Uh, and so there's a, a tool that we use and we actually have the seniors go out in pairs and do an audit, right? And we do, audits are usually done by street segment. And so they they pick a street segment that's important to them in their neighborhood and they go out and audit that with this tool, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then we also talk about self-advocacy. So how do you go about reporting a problem? Um, so as I say to the seniors, you know, you can change your behavior, but if we change an environmental hazard, then it benefits everybody, right? So that's part of the program as well, is just promoting that, that self-advocacy. Uh, so feasibility study. Before I launched this on a big scale, I wanted to make sure that this was going to be helpful. Um, the program was actually, you know, the material covered the content that was necessary, that there'd be no adverse events, which is important when we do uh, clinical studies. And then also um, to tweak uh, the research methods too, to make sure it's, it's what it should be before you launch it on a bigger scale. So feasibility study I conducted at NYU uh, in our, in our uh, occupational therapy department space. Um, and really, like I said, to, to look at the feasibility of the program. And so uh, when we look at feasibility, you're not so much looking at statistically significant differences, right? That's not the purpose. So we look a little bit at effect sizes just to see that descriptively that, um, you know, that's the scientific part of the assessment, the descriptively things are looking or making the improvements that we think they, they should. Um, but we also look at sort of the process, the resources, the management um, of, the, of the intervention uh, and in, of the study. Um, and so I did everything from keep attendance records to keep a, a reflective log about what was working and what doesn't work. Um, also things like uh, fidelity. So what I did is I audio recorded every session and then had a research assistant go through all those audio recordings to make sure I was uh, staying true to the manual and, and doing what um, I said I was set out to do uh, at each of those program sessions. Um, so that was a big part of the feasibility. 
And the findings were interesting. Um, I learned a few things from this feasibility study, which I'm glad I learned uh, before launching the program on a bigger scale. And so one of them is just the ratio of staff to participants um, and sort of what works, especially if you're taking somebody outside and you're training them and coaching them. So what is the ideal numbers of you know, uh, staff to participants? The thing, the most important thing I think I learned from doing this feasibility study was contamination. So it's this idea that, um, so, you know, running the program every week, you're sharing information, you're sharing tips. Um, and so ultimately, you know, thinking about that and, and moving that forward using a randomized controlled trial, if you randomize people within one program site, if you have one, you know, some people talking to the control group, that's, it's great for impact. It's not so great for research. So um, in the end, I discovered that because people were very excited about what they were learning, they were then sharing it with friends. And so, um, you know, when I planned the follow-up study, I realized I really couldn't do any kind of randomization within one sort of community site. It would have to be a randomization at the site level. So that's something I learned from doing the feasibility study. Uh, in terms of the scientific assessment, um, meaning, uh, you know, uh, did people improve? Did they learn something new? Did they use more strategies? And actually the results look good. Again, more descriptive than uh, looking for statistical significance, but really showing that people did uh, gain knowledge in terms of what those risks are. Uh, they uh, self-reported using more strategies, using those strategies more consistently. And then I graphed, um, you know, I had the, the older adult participants track in a calendar anytime they stumbled, tripped, or slipped. And so I tracked that over time and graphed it. And um, it, in the end, it looked like uh, you could, again, descriptive, small, you know, um, study population, but people did, <coughs> excuse me, stumble and trip less, uh, you know, uh, for those in the, um, the treatment group. So, uh, so those are just some of the findings from the feasibility study. And that really led me to move forward with the project and be able to launch the study I'm doing now, which is a, an efficacy trial. So this is just a quick description of uh, what these modules look like. And I mentioned that we meet once a week for seven weeks. And this is the information that we cover. So we talk about uh, the built environment, meaning navigating curbs, parking lots, um, cobbled or, or brick surfaces and stairs. Uh, we also talk about the social environment. So having to address the behavior of uh, drivers, cyclists and other pedestrians and some strategies we can use around that. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples what that might look like. Um, so sometimes people can learn to change their route, right? If they're going from A to B, you can change your route to avoid some problematic areas. Um, also, um, travel time. So if there's certain times of the day they get particularly busy. Um, you know, sometimes just uh, you know picking a different time to do your community, you know, to do your community errands um, can be helpful. And then the other one I like is called standing your ground, uh, because sometimes what happens is, I'll give you an example, a school lets out. Right, and what happens when a school lets out? Kids come running out of a school, right? And actually I had a patient who, that's exactly how she fell. So kids were coming out of the school. Um, she had a little bit of an impaired balance. She tried to get out of their way and ended up uh, falling and having a fracture. And so what I mean by standing your ground is this idea that you stay put, let people walk around you uh, and then keep going, right? As opposed to trying to, to navigate. By the way, that actually works well with, the, um, with bicycle traffic as well. So if you can learn to walk a straight line and not be sort of erratic in your movements um, and give them the right away, you know, that's something else uh, that people um, can sometimes do to make themselves a bit safer. So uh, that's the uh, module two is more focused on the social environment. Session three um, is really the community practice. So we take people outside, we coach them or I coach them um, and, you know, practice some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, we also talk about neighborhood conditions. So how do you navigate for streets so and sidewalk conditions and icy surfaces um, and some strategies around that. Uh, there's something called yak tracks, which is actually a, an adaptation you can put on your own shoe or boot. It gives you some traction in the snow. Um, it's been shown actually in, in rigorous research to be effective in reducing number of, of slips outside. The only thing is that you cannot wear them indoors. And so uh, it's an outdoor only uh, device and it, you, you can't come inside with them on. So there's there's definitely some limitations, but uh, they can be helpful um, in, in bad conditions. Uh, personal factors. So we talk about overexertion. Sometimes people overdo it. I remember there's a uh, woman I'd interviewed early on who told me that she read in the paper that older people should exercise and walk multiple blocks. 
So she went out, walked about 25, 30 blocks and then fell because she overdid it, uh, had a lot of muscle fatigue and um, you know, resulted in stumbling and falling. So uh, again, we, we talk about overexertion, we talk about gay speed, we talk about eyewear. So for example, a lot of us middle-aged and beyond wear uh, progressive lenses, right? Or bifocals. And so if you're going up and down a curb, and you're, you're looking through the reading portion of your vision of your glasses, um, this can be really problematic and, and results in a lot of um, injuries for people. So talking about that as well. Uh, and then we do a community audit using the SWAN tool, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. And then we do a review session. So uh, that's a little bit about uh, the program itself. So this is not my tool. This is the SWAN, which I mentioned was developed by some colleagues in Vancouver. Uh, and basically it's an audit tool that allows people who are neighborhood residents to audit their own neighborhoods segment by segment. Um, and so really it's looking at features of the neighborhood that's gonna affect older, uh, older adults um, and their mobility, especially those with mobility devices. And so it looks at everything from the function of street crossings and sidewalks to um, safety of the street to personal safety of um, pedestrians. So it's a a multi-component um, but easy to use um, audit tool. And it's uh, just to give you a couple examples, <coughs> excuse me, you're looking at everything from curb cuts and their and their um, their characteristics to uh, marked um, pedestrian crossings, um, looking at slopes, uh, looking at also behavior of driver and cyclists. So that's all embedded into the tool. And the reason we use it and invest time and as I said, sending senior uh, older adults out during the program to, to use that tools. It can be used to guide uh, route planning, but also as a resource for, for advocating for change as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this, um, so that tools, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a, a designed to be used by neighborhood residents, um, but I also have uh, been using other tools. So remember I mentioned in the program, we do something called route planning, right? So. Sometimes we can go a different way, choose a different route uh, to be safer. And so one of the tools that has been uh, very helpful is one that was designed by um, Vida at NYU, some, some um, faculty there who basically de designed an interactive uh, map of shadow across the five boroughs of New York, uh, uh, developed basically the shadow accrual map. Um, and basically it was this idea that you, they could calculate the net, the net shadow score. So the percentage of time per day in which uh, that particular street or street segment um, is uh, in under shadow or under shade. And so uh, how this became useful to our program is that we, start, we started to look at black ice, right? And how does black ice form? So I'm not a meteorologist, but we have some information about how black ice forms and in what conditions. And one of the you know, risks for black ice formation is that areas that don't see the sun, right? So in, in addition to having some other um, weather related conditions. And so this map became a really important uh, resource to be able to map out what are the areas that are gonna be prone to black ice, right? So what, what street segments, um, what areas of uh, the neighborhoods I'm working in would be problematic. So we actually use the, the shadow map as a tool to create hard copies of maps of uh, each, you know, each program site's neighborhood to be able to map out areas with, with high risk. And so, you know, working with older adults, some of them are incredibly savvy um, around technology, more savvy than I am. And others, uh, I, have, I have older adults in groups, in my groups who don't own a cell phone and don't own a computer. So we wanted to basically take something um, and, and use it to create something that's low tech. And so we use the, the um, the shadow accrual map and basically then transcribe that information into a very simplified uh, map where we can mark off in your neighborhood, you know, here's some areas that you want to be super careful of when these weather conditions are present. So that's another tool um, that we use. And again, for route planning, right? If you know that when you come out of your grocery store, that this particular segment is going to be high risk, um, then maybe you can think about going a different route. So that's kind of how we're, how we're using it. Um, and then, so yeah, I think that's that's sort of where I've come from <laughs> and just a little bit about where I'm going with this. And so I'm actually, the efficacy trial is currently underway. So this is a multi-site um, intervention study and efficacy study. And I'm basically collaborating with a, a wonderful community partner in New York City. Uh, and I'm in eight different um, uh, community sites 
that are naturally occurring retirement communities. And so in NORC, we call it a NORC for short. It's um, an area where you have a high concentration of older adults. It's not people who moved in there necessarily in their 60s, 70s, or 80s, but it's actually places where people probably moved in as young adults or middle-aged um, adults, and they've just aged in place, right? They've stayed there. And so we have certain pockets where we have high concentrations of older adults, um, and then a lot of social service organizations have sprung up to support older adults and, and um, you, know, pro you know, provide services within those communities. And so that's where my intervention study has taken me, is working with NORCs collaboratively. So as I mentioned, eight sites um, over the few years of the study. Um, I'm in a couple of sites now and uh, um, primarily in Coney Island, uh, and I'll be going to run the waitlist control groups um, this spring in, in the Bronx and in other Brooklyn neighborhoods. And so, um, so that's where I'm at now, looking at really at the efficacy of this. Um, and then if it looks good, and so far the results do look promising in terms of um, significant uh, improvement in people who, who are participants. Um, my, my plan going forward is this. So I wanna develop training materials so that other occupational therapists can administer the program in their own communities. Um, there's a, a federal agency that supports a lot of work uh, around uh, community living and older adults uh, called ACL, Administration for Community Living. And so hopefully, if I said the results look promising and, and do look good, then I would uh, be, I have my program vetted uh, by them to be considered an Evans Space Falls Prevention Program and therefore eligible for, um, for funding uh, to be able to you know, launch this, launch this in other communities. And so uh, also I hope to continue to collaborate. Uh, I'm not a data scientist, I'm a health uh, science and um, social science researcher, but I would love to do ongoing collaboration um, with engineers, urban planners, uh, people specialize in data visualization. So I think generate more resources um, that can be used in a program such as this, right? So being able to really, look at some key um, hazards, mapping those, using that again for, for route planning. Um, and then of course, we're in New York City and we have a lot of diversity and my program's in English, uh, which is a problem and, and I'm doing the best I can right now. We, we have a few English as second language speakers in, in my programs, uh, but it'd be great to develop programs that are in different languages and that are also culturally relevant to different, um, to different groups. And so that's kind of where I'm going with this. Uh, and then I just want to show you something. This makes me smile. Uh, so this is what running groups during a COVID <laughs> uh, pandemic looks like. So we have to follow the New York, the DIFTA, New York, uh, New, York, sorry, New York City Department for the Aging Guidelines. So we have to be socially distanced, wear our masks, um, and you know this kind of thing. So this makes me smile. This is one of my program sites I'm in right now, and uh, we've had to make some adaptations to uh, to make it work. So and then just a few references as well. So I guess that's all I had to say. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I don't know if people have questions or comments. Um, yeah, I have Thank a you. question. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead. We can start with Jackie also. Um, but yeah, I, I really thank you so much for, for that talk that was really, really interesting and I, I'm, I think there's a few of us who are um, hopefully chomping at the bit a bit to, to get here. I, I will say feel free to, um, you can either kind of just grab my attention or you can also feel free to add your questions to the chat box um, if you don't want to uh, kind of say it out loud yourself, but we can start off with Jackie. Okay, yeah, so I was curious what you said about um, data visualization like and getting more engineers involved in that. So. Um, I could see one clear way perhaps would be to take the shadow map information and combine it with weather forecasts uh, within the next few days and then create like real time ice, black ice maps. Um, are there other areas outside of the black ice that you can provide, offer as, as examples of how you could see data visualization being yeah. helpful? So I've had some conversations in the past with people about this. I know there's, uh, actually there was a postdoctoral student um, at NYU who's now moved on and I've met with him and his team uh, to talk about other possibilities. And one of the other possibilities is this, people know their neighborhoods pretty well. 
right? And so older adults, we have this idea of life space mobility. And as we get older, we tend to sort of focus our lives in sort of a smaller geographical area. So I think telling them where the crack in the pothole is, they know that. <laughs> but I think there's other things, for example, weather related conditions um, that you don't know. So these streets don't get cleared first, or these are areas where you're going to have, when, when the weather is adverse, these are you know, areas that are going to be more problematic in terms of snow clearance. or um, So those kind of things I think might be useful in the future. And I have a few other ideas um, in terms of public transit use and sort of the accessibility of that. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually hoping, uh, I know we have a conversation scheduled a little bit later today, uh, with the CUSP team and, and possibly looking at that as a cup, CUSP cap, cut, sorry, <laughs> that was a tongue twister, a CUSP capstone project to be able to work with me, um, to be able to uh, think a little bit about sort of usage of uh, public buses and some barriers to that um, for older adults. And so those are just a couple of ideas I have, I think would be, would be interesting going forward. Very cool, thank you. Oh, it's have to go next. If not, I have a question. Um, so, you know, apologies. I've, I've been having some technical issues today, so I, I, I may have missed it. But I wonder if you could go back and talk a little bit more about um, the audits that you were doing. You said that you were pairing up folks and kind of having them and do. Yeah, so there's the SWAN tool, as I mentioned, is, a, is developed by a, a, some researchers in Canada in collaboration with um, some, uh, some colleagues, I think of theirs in Germany and, and in Quebec. And basically they designed this tool to be able to audit street segment by street segment. So it's basically looking at each um, segment in your neighborhood that's of meaning, meaning, you know, has meaning to you. You actually go there and spend time there and really looking systematically at everything from the street crossings to the quality of the street and the sidewalks to uh, the behavior of drivers and cyclists. So it's a way for, and I actually, in my program, one of the weeks, uh, it's coming up actually, is, uh, is actually send them out in pairs. So the seniors go out in pairs to go audit those segments and really to use that tool to really identify uh, where the problems lie, um, but then also, uh, you know, I, I use it, like I said, it's an advocacy tool, but it's also to promote awareness, right? So you're not just looking at every, you know, crack and uneven sidewalk, but you're looking more broadly at other issues that we know are problematic. And so it's, it's a good tool to promote awareness, but also to say, hey, I, I did an audit, you know, and uh, here's some issues that I found. And so that's, that's a little bit about the SWAN tool. I guess, and I think that kind of leads into some, that where my question was going. Was, yeah. So once you've kind of pull that information from from the different kind of street segments if you could speak a little a bit about how i guess you're you've been utilizing that data or how you're operationalizing yeah. it uh moving forward. yeah good question so i guess that you know it, uh, dr mahmoud who created the tool has used this uh to a much broad you know in a much broader way in vancouver and they actually use it they they collect scores they compare neighborhoods they compare street segments and then they use it, they bring in city officials um, to discuss their findings. Um, so they do a much more extensive audit and use it uh, as a platform and a jumping off point to be able to share this information, um, as I said, at the city level to make changes. So remember, I have a seven week program and this is one component of the program. So I haven't, we haven't sort of gone to that level um, in the Stroll Safe program. As I said, it's more promoting awareness um, people can, like I said, after doing the audit, really look at what are the problematic areas. And when they do, you know, report problems, they have a little bit more information. Much. Uh, we have another question. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you for the very, very interesting uh, presentation. I was wondering whether there is, whether you can see from your tool if there is some correlation between um, green infrastructure and some of your findings. For example, you said that people were not willing to ask for help. I wonder if that's an issue of walking in a pavement versus being in a park where people are chiller and so on. Uh, maybe, uh, again, the way they feel uh, is affected and you can quantify essentially kind of that um, benefit that a park or greener infrastructure can bring. 
Thank you. Really interesting question. Yeah, so I haven't looked at that. Um, only beyond the point of, like I said, it's people are reluctant to ask for help. And whether I've, I haven't really looked at sort of the influences on that or the, the reasons behind that, but that's interesting to think that it could be uh, based on the environment that you're in. And uh, so an interesting question uh, going forward. So, hi, thank you so much for the, for the talk. Uh, great. Uh, I. I guess I have a couple of riffs on some of the previous questions. So uh, one is related to this last question. Uh, looking more broadly, have you looked at other environmental factors that may you know, increase or decrease uh, the risk of you know, falls or you know, like risk factors uh, in these neighborhoods? I mean, is there any way to like measure or assess uh, what those factors are? So we know from previous research sort of what those risks are. So again, some of it's my own work, um, but you know, qualitative research. But if you look also, other people have looked at this. And so we have more epidemiological studies um, that show what are the risks um, and what's, what are the specific risks for individuals at, the, at, at uh, the individual level and then at the environmental level. So there has been some work definitely done on this um, uh, you know, to kind of figure out what are those hot spots, What are those uh, you know, hazards that are most um, problematic for people? So that we do have that some of that information. Yeah, I think that'll be very interesting in terms of connecting with this group, right? Because I mean, like a lot of the work that we do is about uh, monitoring environmental conditions. Uh, so obviously there is weather, but you know, like even more specific things like, like flooding, uh, flooded locations, okay. or like, you know, increases in air pollution or noise pollution in certain locations, you know, stressors that might somehow influence behavior uh, in these situations. It might be interesting to see, you know, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, dependencies are there, right? That we could study together. And I guess uh, in terms of like uh, riffing from, from Jackie's question early on, um, when you have a dynamic, dynamically changing situation, right? Like weather related, right? Like the, the appearance of black eyes. Um, what is the best way to convey information back to the subjects, right? Like, I mean, what are, what are because I mean, you're, you're talking about these printouts, but uh, this is very difficult to handle in a dynamically changing environment. Yeah. So, so I'm just, just trying to understand from, from, your, from your studies, you know, what, what have you observed might be alternative mechanisms for conveying that information back uh, yeah. to the people affected? Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Um, I think, you know, there's a changing environment and, you know, having a hard copy of a map is not dynamic and it doesn't account for changes. Like I said, how we're using the, the current map of black ice is just, you know, based on this data, we know that in the winter, these are going to be areas. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a dynamic process, but I think, I think that's um, also going to be something interesting for the future is to create, um, you know, if we're going to create something that's more interactive, uh, that is more, um, you know, sensitive to time, to time changes, then we need something that's going to be extremely user friendly, right? So just for example, the shadow map is really interesting, but, um, but to give that to an older adult and say, here you go, um, <laughs> it's not helpful, right? So that's why we had to think about it, create something that was um, much easier to use, much easier to identify in terms of your own neighborhood, right? And make it specific to the individual too, because I mentioned the life space mobility piece. And so really you wanna know, you know, a lot of your life gets spent within these certain number of blocks, right? And so you wanna sort of customize it to the person and not just sort of have something that's generic. Um, but I agree, you know, having something more dynamic would be great, but I think you would need something that is designed to be very user-friendly for people with different levels of, of ability with regards to using, um, using technology. Great, thank you. I have another question, but I'll wait to see if any, I don't want to ask my second question until everyone's got a chance to ask yeah. them first, if there's anyone else. Okay, well, you guys can think about it. Um, so this is a little bit on a different note, but um, you mentioned in the beginning of your talk about um, like exercise classes. Um, and that's one of the things I'm really interested in with my work in um, robotic rehabilitation for stroke patients. And how do you, and stroke patients are a lot of elder adults. And so how do you customize exercise programs for people with disabilities of various sorts, whether it's age-related or neuromuscular-related or both? 
Um, and I was wondering if, if it is just a matter of slowing the exercise class down. So like instead of doing 10 reps, you do two reps or are there other things that you like found that are important to consider when yeah. you're developing? Yeah, no, that's a good point. So it's a whole different thing. So with, with, with aging and we're all aging, right? <laughs> uh, different things happen. And so I, I primarily work with, um, with well elders in the community. And of course, that doesn't mean that they don't have some chronic health conditions, but uh, you know, primarily they're, they're not people with neurological um, disorders. But what happens to us as we get older is we lose muscle mass, right? Well, sarcopenia. Uh, we also have a decline in our uh, cardiopulmonary endurance, right? So sort of that level that we can achieve um, has become affected. Um, we also have changes in our vision and hearing, right? Um, and sometimes it takes us a little longer to process information. Not everybody, but sometimes we'll have a little bit of slowing. So there's many factors um, that impact people's ability to follow a class. Um, what's interesting is since I did that study, uh, we have more and more resources in the community for people that are more like, not specific to a, one patient, but that are more uh, appropriate for people of a, maybe a different fitness level. And so, for example, uh, one of the programs I talk about is Silver Sneakers. And so it's, it's uh, Phil Silver Sneakers is basically if you have Medicare Advantage plan, so not everybody qualifies, but um, there's an opportunity to do either online classes or in-person classes free of charge at different you know, gyms and, and um, community centers that are more geared towards an older adult population. And so those kind of programs are, are great because it's something that uh, more people can participate in and not just people who have a high level of fitness. I mean, we have marathon runners who are older adults too, um, but not everybody can, you know, can um, engage in that kind of level of activity. So it's, uh, there's more and more programs out there, but, um, but yeah, it's, they, they need to be just sort of tailored towards somebody with a different, you know, maybe different, um, slightly different fitness level. Great, thank you for that. Any other questions? We've got time for a couple more. Well, I have another one, but I really just don't want to be a bully here. So please chime in <laughs> if anyone else has anything. No, okay. Um, I'm just curious, like, like as you were talking about, like going back more to like the conversation about like data visualization, um, assuming we can get user-friendly real-time data visualization on your smartphone and that elder adults feel comfortable using this, which in itself is like a whole research topic. Um, but uh, like things like Waze, for instance, are just like so fascinating to me that crowdsourcing actually works to give you information like that. So I'm just wondering, if similar things, maybe in the SWAN program, I wasn't sure if that was part of it, crowdsourcing or not, but if there's ways that you, that people could use crowdsourcing, for instance, to be like, oh, this is, there's a lot of potholes on the street, or like there's, there's been this many falls on the street, um, or like even for instance, like your smartphone has an IMU in it, I think most of them, and so you can maybe use that to develop an algorithm that automatically detects that someone has fallen um, and then and then have like updated information about where falls are happening in a, in a neighborhood or in a city um, if any work has been done like that or if that's something that yeah not that I'm aware of but I think some really interesting ideas for the future and uh, you know to be honest like I said you know vision zero they do produce um, reports right about Particularly, not so much around the you know falls because of tripping or slipping or stumbling, but they produce reports around uh, pedestrian um, unsafe zones. Um, but again, that's that's like a hard copy. That's you know what I mean. So I think, but there's definitely I think room for that um, area of study to have something that um, is more dynamic and you can use on your cell phone and you know in in real time. So. Cool. Great. Okay, so last call, unless there's <laughs> last call for a question. And if not, we can end it by once again, uh, thanking uh, Tracy so much for coming. We really enjoyed the talk. Uh, I think it 
definitely generated a number of ideas. Um, and I think um, I'm especially interested to kind of see, um, as you discussed, uh, possibly generating a capstone project. I look forward to kind of seeing what that might look like as well. So um, yeah, we'll give you right. one more thanks. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks um, we'll for coming. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for inviting me. Take care. Thank you, Tracy. Great talk. Thank you. A pleasure to see you. Thanks.